This is Join Us in France, episode 162. I'm Annie, and it's good to be back after a wonderful vacation. More on that at the end of the show. The topic of today's show is French wine questions, brought to you by the Join Us in France community on Facebook, but also answers from French wine scholar Dave Walsh. But first, let me introduce myself a little bit. My name is Annie Sargent, and Join Us in France is the only travel show exclusively dedicated to helping you prepare your big trip to France. I was born and raised in France, but I went to the UK and the US for college, and then I lived in the US for 20 years of my life. I have been back living in France for over a decade now. I didn't work in the travel industry. This podcast is something I created because being a bit of a geek and having lived far away from France for so long, I was eager to rediscover my own country, and it turns out that I also love to talk about France with other people. My occasional co-host and good friend Elise has had the opposite life experience. She was born and raised in the U.S., moved to France to complete college. She is an art historian and she has been living in France and working in the travel industry for a long time. Because Elise is a professional tour guide, we decided to organize small group tours a few times a year. I created a small business called Addicted to France, and you can read reviews about Addicted to France tours on TripAdvisor. To see what tours are available on what dates, go to addictedtofrance.com. On the show, you will also hear from different listeners who visited France and went to share how it went, what they learn. They want to give you specific recommendations. They want people who are going after them to learn from their experience. I call those trip reports, but I could also have called them listener travel tips, listener insider tips, or listener trip reviews. The point is, you get to hear candid reviews of other people's vacation You know they are not fake reviews because you can hear it straight from their mouth and we all help one another have a better vacation experience in France. At the end of the show, you will hear how you can contact me if that's something you'd like to do. And I'm not just looking for glowing reviews. I do ask people to bring up things that didn't go as well as they had hoped. As you know, Elise and I offer occasional tours and the Dordogne tour for September 2018 is sold out. I'm really happy about that. It's very popular and that's great because Elise and I are really looking forward to doing that tour. The next tour coming up in the calendar is Paris in early October. There is still room for that one. So if you're itching to join us in France in real life, visit addictedtofrance.com to see all the details. In today's episode, we're talking about French wine. Now, wine is one of those things where a little bit is wonderful and too much is catastrophic. So I want to advocate for moderation. Have some, but listen to all the good medical advice out there because wine can be really bad for you. And like most things in life, wine is even better when you understand it better. So I am really grateful to French wine scholar Dave Walsh for helping me answer your questions about French wine. He makes it fun and simple. I think you're going to enjoy this conversation. If you're interested in wine, you should also listen to episode 158, which is the first part of my conversation with Dave Walsh. Episode 128 about wine touring in Bourgogne. Episode 124 about the Wine Museum in Paris. There are several more. I don't want to name them all here. But remember, there is a search button on the joinusinfrance.com website. Go ahead and dig up old treasures on the site. Stay tuned after the interview to hear my thanks 
to listeners who support the show on Patreon, my personal update, what's happening around me, how to connect with me, and any news concerning the show. Also, the French tip of the week is back. And now, here's the interview. <laughs> And thank you for uh, answering listener questions about wines in France. How are you doing? I'm doing well, Annie. Excellent. Okay. So we had a bunch of questions submitted by listeners. Shall we yeah. go into that? See, uh, you know, yeah, see absolutely. what they wanted to know about? Yeah. I, um, I jotted them down here. Actually, okay. one of them was not submitted online but came through Sue and the um, the Addicted to France Paris tour. Yes. And I won't quote who it came from. But <laughs> I'll, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll summarize w w what uh, what this individual asked. Was um, He said, I like big Napa red wines. What uh -huh. wines in France are most similar? Okay. So, well, that's a hard question because I have no idea. Yeah, but but again, if he is saying he likes big Napa reds, he is probably talking about Cabernet Sauvignon, Cabernet ah. Franc, and Molo wines. Mm -hmm. so if we look at which regions make those kind of big beefy reds, we're going to head directly to Bordeaux. Right. And we did talk about the fact that Bordeaux wines are quite expensive. So if you'd like to spend the money, absolutely go and look look for Bordeaux wines. But uh, two other regions that make big reds, heavy reds, very dark in color and um, high profile wines, we're going to go down to the southwest. Anywhere we talked about what we talked about those regions, mm -hmm. and yep. maybe, and maybe also head down to the Languedoc region, down closer to the Mediterranean, right? Hot climates. Also well known for the bigger red style wines. Right, Cao would also be a bigger, kind of full body red. Your your what I call your QPR, your quality to price ratio, your bang for your buck. <laughs> is heavier in, in you're going to have your 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 euro will go further down in longer dark in southwest than it will go in Bordeaux. Definitely, if you only yeah. have twenty bucks to spend. Don't try to buy a nice uh, burgundy. It's not going to yeah. happen. Oh, not at all. <laughs> all right. Very good. That's um, good to know. So can I say these folks' names? Oh, sure. Also? First yeah, names, so, maybe. or. Yeah, so Lisa wrote, since, wine, since French wines are named by region and not by grape, basic understanding of which grapes are primarily used in the region would be helpful for those of us who who know which grapes we like. Right. So in the previous episode, we kind of went over the regions. Yeah. And I'm going to add some show notes. So absolutely, I would look at those show notes. Yeah. Find which grapes you like and then, you know, go to your local retail store or go online and try to figure out what wines you can buy from those regions. Right. But it's really hard because very often wines in France are blended. Absolutely. And so you're not going to get 100% this grape. You know, you're going to get 80% this, 5% this, 15% that. And right. they don't necessarily even list that on the bottle. Yeah, they, they don't. Sometimes they do. And when, it, when the wines come to the States, we sometimes see on the bottles listed, you know, 80%, 10%, 5%, 5%. Ah, okay, okay. okay. The French term is... Cépage. Is that how you say yeah, it? Yeah, cépage, yes. Cépage. So we do sometimes see it on the back label that they might, but it is, I would say, not in more than one in four bottles that we actually see that listed. Yeah, yeah. So it's it's kind of hard to... But, I mean, you do know that if you're buying a Burgundy, you're buying a Pinot Noir mostly. Yes. Um... If you're buying a... Northern Rhone, it's mostly Syrah. Yeah. If it's Southern Rhone, it's going to be a blend of Grenache, Syrah, and Red. Yeah. If you're, buying a, Cao, if, if you're buying a Cahors, you're buying a, um, a Malbec. Yeah. So those are kind of general understandings, but 
But it in does. Bordeaux, it's blended. It's and it Loire, blended. it's all blended. Yeah. Provence yeah. also. I mean, all of these places they blend. Uh, Loire doesn't. Tip, no, some of the regions in Loire will make 100% Cabernet Franc. Oh, okay. Yeah. So again, you have to know the region. Once you know the region, but, and we didn't really talk about this. Why France does this, right? No, but Which let's do that. Yeah, this is really interesting. You know, it's really fr frustrating when I think when you go there for the first time, you say, well, how come it doesn't say Cabernet Franc on this bottle of wine? Yeah. How am I supposed to know this? And I think it's it's partly its history. You know, as you educate your kids and the kids grow up in that culture, they will start to understand that this wine comes, this grape is grown in that region. But for an outsider, it is. it takes a bit of while of practice and understanding and reading and researching to, to determine that. But it really, to me, it is, it's, it's, it's just, it's cultural and it's history that they don't list them typically. Right, because in France, French people, if you ask them what wines they like, they will tell you, I like, and then they tell you a region or a name of a village or a name of an AOC. Yeah, yeah. You know, that's how we remember the wines. So when we go to the grocery store, instead of having sections by types of grapes, we have sections by regions of France. Yeah. So you will have the Burgundy wines and the Corbière wines and the Bordeaux wines and all of those. And we just grow up knowing, yeah, I like Bordeaux and I, and I don't like, uh, I don't know, uh, Beaujolais. Yeah. And that's yep. that's it. You know, you put you stick that in your head, and then yeah. you don't go buy in a Beaujolais because if you're me, you're not gonna like it so much. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah. But then, but but knowing that Beaujolais makes mostly Cabernet, then um, you probably don't know that because you you just you think of the region, not the grape. Whereas I think in the U.S. When I say I'm going to go and have a great Napa wine, it could be one of 15 different varietals because that's what they're growing in Napa. Yeah. But let's go for 400 years and Napa is only growing two grapes or three grapes. Mm. When you say Napa wine, it's completely different because the evolution of these grapes in the regions, as I said, we're going back to, what did we say, 14th centuries when Gamay was, was expelled from, from Burgundy. Yeah. I mean, this is a long time ago that these wines have had time the grapes have had time to find homes and then stay in those stay in those regions. So, you know, a French people know that and they've understood it and it goes back home because your grandparents were drinking the same. If they were drinking Caos, then they were drinking Malbec. Right. And that hasn't so, changed very much. Exactly. So I think, you know, it's, it, it does. But they did. But the, the French people don't know when they're drinking Caos, they're drinking Malbec. They, no, and honestly, you know they what? don't. Unless they're a sommelier or something, or somebody yeah. interested in wine, they don't even know. They probably don't even care. And they don't care. They don't want to know. Uh, they just want to. They just yeah. want to know that you know. I like to buy my bottles from this area. Like I was going to tell you uh, the, the uh, in the previous episode, and I I didn't get to it, but uh, the Provence area, you have these. Um, Uh, around Camargue, you have these really light uh, rosés, and they're called gris, gray. That's what we call okay. them. So yeah. you just know if you like the type of rosé that's from Camargue because it's a, it's a lighter color, it's a lighter in flavor, or if you like the types of rosé that, that are from Corsica, which are beefier and, you know, so you just... You just growing. You grow up knowing. Ah, I like rosés from Corsica, and so mm -hmm. at the grocery store you just go. Ah, I'm go here's the Corsica section, and I'll get one. And it's going to be different bottles all the time. It's going to be different providers, but they're going to have kind of a similar feel and taste to them. Yeah, and so and again, it hits on the fact that in the old world, the the regions believe that the regions provide a specific style. In other words, like Provence um, Rosé or uh, Burgundy. Let's take Burgundy. They mm. don't need to put Pinot Noir on the bottle because no. they believe that the region of Burgundy produces a certain style of, of wine. 
Yeah. Now this is completely. So, this is going to make you think that I'm truly ignoramus. But I lived in the U.S. for 18 years, right? I am French, yeah. but I lived in the U.S. for 18 years. And before I left for the U.S., I didn't really drink any. You know, I mean, I was too young. I didn't drink anything. And so I learned about wine culture. I started learning in the U.S. And uh, uh, I saw the movie. What was that movie about Pinot Noir? Um, Sideways. Sideways, yes. Yeah. And so we moved to France uh, 13 years ago, and I go to the store, and I want to buy some Pinot Noir. And I'm having a bear of a time finding anything that says Pinot Noir. And I was like, this is so complicated. <laughs> what, the, you know? And then I asked a salesperson and, and, he, and he knew to direct me to the, to the Burgundy area. And I drank some and I was like, well, I don't particularly like that so much. I prefer the other types. But, you know, <laughs> um, but it, you really... Um, <clears throat> Well, what I, I think what I didn't like is the price I had to pay for that yeah. bottle because by then we, I had had a few of the local, you know, Corbière, et cetera, which are so nice and so cheap that then if you pay 20 for a bottle from Burgundy, you're like, well, this better be really good. <laughs> you yeah. Know? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but anyway, so that, that was me. Even as a French person, if you don't, uh, know a ton about wines. You don't even know that Pinot Noir is Burgundy. Like, yeah, ex- yeah, yeah. Anyway, but it, it does. It comes back to that that belief that the region is more important. That the sum of the parts is more important than the. That's really how wine, a French wine, thinks thinks about it. In other words, Burgundy is more important as a region than the Pinot Noir grape. Yeah. Did, does that make does that make sense? So yes. that, but I think if you grow up in that culture, you know that that Burgundy equals Pinot Noir. If it's white Burgundy, if it's from a place like Mousseau, then it's going to be Chardonnay. Mm-hmm. It's just, it's just it's, you just know because it's it's A or B. It's just it, it, and and you kind of get to know that. Yeah. Absolutely yeah. right. When you go to like um, Oregon. They probably grow 25 different grapes there. So you can't say, well, this is an Oregon wine. You have to list the grape because it could be one of 13, whereas in Burgundy, it's one of three. Yeah. Yeah. Very good. Okay. All right. More questions. Bob, Bob asks, in your opinion, is there some qual- distinctive quality that which makes French wines unique and stand out from other wines from other parts of the world? Well, mm. Annie, we touched upon this in the previous episode. Um, probably France grows more, has a bigger diversity and more high quality wines than any other country in the world. And, you know, again, having said that, you know, I'm sure someone's going to argue with me against that. But that's, again, it's just, that's just my opinion. And it's probably the opinion of many other folks, right? Well, that's because we have so much history and so many ways to train in wines. Yeah. The yeah. first high school that was that had a special program to train winemakers was in Burgundy. You know, it was one of the very first high schools in in Burg in that area in that region. Mm-hmm. And they just had a program for winemakers because they knew they needed to train a lot of winemakers. And yeah. it, it, in France, it's really not difficult to get training to make wine. You yeah. can go lots of places. You know, in America, you might have to travel to a specific state and enroll in a special program and do all these things. Well, at any agricultural uh, university in France, you're going to learn the stuff. You know, you don't yeah. need to go far. So, yeah, it's, it's all over. But you're absolutely right. And, and what I would say is that you know, all regions are unique. Every region in the world growing grapes and making wine is, is unique in their own regard. I think with France having had such a long, long running history, and I made a note here that I have to, um, yeah, the, the Greeks the, brought the original vines to the area of Marseille in Provence yeah. in 6th century BC. Right. <laughs> That's a long time that France has had the opportunity to fine-tune its winemaking styles and, and regions. 
Right. And I think, you know, it doesn't make it necessarily better, but it certainly it, it, it becomes the yardstick to which other regions can can measure. And they certainly do, whether they admit it or not, you know, um, certain parts of the U.S. look to the styles that France is making that maybe not, but, and they use that as a measuring stick against their own lines. They don't try to emulate it, but they use it as a measuring stick to say, are we, is the quality matching France's quality? Right. Not making exactly French style wines. Right, right, right. But they want yeah. a good wine that keeps a reasonable number of years that <clears throat> can be exported without too much trouble that does the, where the cork doesn't melt into the bottle i mean there are quality issues with some wines that are produced that are just you know if you don't drink it within six months it's crap sure yeah yeah and so, again that, that's a, that's another question of um i touched on this that sur, the Syrahs made in northern rhone are meant to age the meant to age for literally 5, 10, 15 years. And they're actually designed and they're made for, for aging. Yeah. Whereas Provencal, Provencal Rosé, you no. lay that out for two years, it's not going to taste fresh and nice and drinkable. Yeah, no, you, <laughs> no. You, you, yeah, so we have, uh, we have this thing in French called the vin de garde. So it's a wine for keeping. And when you go to okay. a winery, you, I often ask them, uh, est-ce que c'est un vin de garde ou est-ce que c'est un vin à boire maintenant? So a, yeah. a, a keeper's wine or a wine that you can drink within a, a year or two. And if most winemakers in my region, if they're honest, they will all tell you, drink it within three years. Yeah. You know, because these yeah. are, we don't, in the Southwest, they don't, very few make a wine that you can keep for 20 years. Yeah. And there are people who keep wines for 20 years and then they open them and they're disgusting. Yeah. yeah. That happens every day in France. <laughs> you know, it's it's not like and and of course this kind of knowledge gets around because people talk discuss it on forums etc. But I have <clears throat> I have uh, neighbors and friends who have uh, cellars where they buy, a, you know, cases of wine just to keep for 5 years, 10 years, 20 years. And sometimes they have a bad surprise. Yeah. But of course, yeah. these are wines they paid 20 euros for. And what they hope is that in 20 years, it'll be 2,000 or 20,000 even. Sure, sure. You know? Yeah. But it, it doesn't happen that often. No, and I think, again, knowing which wines can be um, kept and knowing which wines can't be. And I think the, the winemakers specifically design those wines. Yeah. Uh, just like what you said, when you go and you ask them, should I keep this or should I drink it soon? And then they'll give you a, a window of, of, of time, yeah. one to two years, you know, five to ten, whatever, right? Yes. Uh, because they know it. They, they've been in this game for long enough that they, they themselves are keeping wines to taste over time to see how they how they age. Of course. And there's yeah. people in France who buy wine for their retirement, for instance. Sure. So they're like 52 years old, they're my age, and they say, ah, I'm retiring in 10 years, I'm going to buy some cases of wine for my retirement party. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, they do that, or they want to buy a wine for when their kid turns 18. So yeah. the kid's born this year, the kid turns, you know, when the kid turns 18, we'll, we'll open up these bottles of wine or when yeah. my kid marries or something. And they will actually go to wineries and, and tell them, this is what I want to do. I want to keep this wine for a special occasion 10 years from now or 15 years from now. And, and you can do that in France. You can ask, but most of them anyway, in the Southwest, I think to do that, you'd have to go to Bordeaux or to Burgundy or places like that. To, to yeah, no, where you I, I, yeah, no, I, I agree. Yeah. So Susan asks, um, how does the French soil impact the wine? As in, how does the same variety differ when grown in the States? It's a great question. Yeah. And honestly, there are a number of different iTunes podcasts just on this subject. Mm -hmm. And maybe I can um, try to find them and put them in the show notes. Yeah. Because it's not an easy question to answer. And the reason is that um, 
Well, it's it's the it's a debatable topic, but also there are folks that have PhDs in the su- in the subject that work as consultants around the world to advise different wineries on what varietals to grow on what soil type. Right. So, um, and and then we also should remember in answering Susan's questions that client, the vine clone and the winemaker not just the soil, have an impact on the style. And the, in answering this question, um, if we don't even jump from France to the U.S., but to stay within France, I give an example that Alsace has 13 different soil types in that small region of Alsace. <laughs> if you take a look at Riesling, which is a white wine, if you grow Riesling on clay, limestone, granite, or slate, the wine profile flavors are completely different mm. with regards to fruit and the amount of min- mineral um, profiles. So in answering Susan's question, it's very hard to say that Cabernet Sauvignon grown in the southwest is equal to this, but if you look at it in Napa, it equals that because mm-hmm. there's some mm-hmm. other influences, climate uh, winemaker, et cetera, et cetera. Right, right. right. But one thing I would say is that probably we have to remember that in the new world, we have a lot more sunshine in Napa than we do in, say, parts of Southwest or even in, in Bordeaux, right? Yeah. And that influences it extremely in that. What they say in Napa is that the, the reds are more what they call fruit forward. You get a lot more fruit, whereas in Bordeaux, you get a lot more earthy notes. So the, the wine has a lot more, it tastes more um, like, like, um, Earth, earth flavors, mm-hmm. where you'll taste a lot more fruits. You'll be able to say, oh, this has, it tastes like cherries, it tastes like um, blueberries, etc. Interesting. In world, it's, it's, and that's more influenced by weather than, than soil. So I'm not sure I actually answered Susan's question though, because I don't think there's an easy explanation. Right. Um, but I can, as I said, we can put some show notes, we'll put some show notes in uh, at the end of this episode and then Susan can, if she feels like it, she can listen to some of the yeah. uh, books that I listen, that I'll yeah. list. But you know, terroir happens in America as well. Yeah, yeah. I mean, obviously it does because terroir is just the, the confluence of all the of all the things that make it happen. So that your soil, yeah. your wind, your temperature, your sunshine, your rain, your all of that. Yeah. And you have those uh, parameters in America as well. So. Sure. sure. And then the last question is from Jennifer and it's a three parter, but so she asks, talk about French, one areas we don't see so much in the U.S., such as Muscadet from the Nantes Loire region, the wines from Jura, and of course, go deep on the rosés. We are now finally seeing more of in the U.S. Why are the Tavao wines so special? <laughs> so it's a kind of three-part question. So let's let's talk about um, well, let's talk about Muscadet first. Yeah, I did a little bit talk about it. It's it's um it's the grape is originally from Bur- Burgundy. And has a different name in Burgundy. It's actually sometimes around the world known as Melon de Bourgogne. Is that right, Andy? Melon de Bourgogne, yep. Okay. Has accents of sea and citrus. Hmm. And it's the way the style is made, Any, it makes the wine. So typically it's a, it's a, it's a white wine. It's, it's picked, it's pressed, and then it's fermented. And you'll see on the bottle labeling sometimes Sir Lee. And right. what that means right. is it is Sir Lee means it is aged on the yeast cells. So as the yeast grows ah, in the wine. Ah, Sir Lee, okay. So as the wine sits on the yeast, they use a technique, it's a stirring. They stir the wine. In French, the word is but, but, batonnage. Yes, batonnage, yes, batonnage. So they stir the wine, and the dead yeast cells start to break down. In, in biological terms, it's called autolysis. So they start to degrade. 
And what they release is proteins. And those proteins in the dead yeast cells impart this kind of aged, and, a, and a, it gives it almost like a, a more, what they call a more of a mouthfeel to the wine. Okay. Or bready. It tastes more bready. Tastes more like 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 if you smell the wine, you almost say, some folks would say it smells like bread because it is. It's it's the yeast. And um, and it's a so it's a style that is it's it's done on purpose and it's to impart this kind of more yeasty flavor to it. You also pick this up in champagne. Certain champagnes that are aged for a long time on yeast will have this kind of bready uh, smell to them. Hmm. Um, uh, and as, as I said, and you also see on their bottles, it will say, and you're going to have to help me out here, Sevry et Main. Hang on. Yes. Did you write it down? No, I didn't. All right. Spell it. Let's see. Yes. E V R E. Servir oh servir frais. Yes. So the, yeah, so so that means re- serve it f- cool. No, 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 no. The names of the rivers are Sevri oh. and the other name of the river is M A I N E. M A I N E. Men. Yeah. So S E R V no, S E V R E. S E V R E. Oh, Sèvres, Sèvres Men. Yeah, yeah. Ah, okay. There are two rivers there. Okay. There in in Loire, and this region is is right between the two rivers, so you'll often see on the bottles, surly, meaning it's been aged on lees on on the uh, dead yeast. Yes. And then also Sèvres et Men, meaning the region. It's between ah. the two. Okay. Interesting. Uh, interestingly, this is the wine that Sue most enjoyed at the Paris wine tasting. Right, because we did a wine tasting uh, as part of the tour uh, with Addicted to France, and she enjoyed that one. That's that's interesting. Yeah, and it is designed to pair with regional seafood. Right. So I gave that to Elise and she gave me one of her reds because I didn't like yeah. it that much. <laughs> so, so it's yeah. interesting. See, if, and, and there's no shame in liking what you like and not liking what you don't like. See, just because yeah. I tell you that I don't like, I don't know, that I'm not super in love with uh, wines for Burgundy doesn't mean that y- you shouldn't be in love with them. You know, obviously people love those. Most people love those. Yeah. Me, I think they're overpriced. But, well, you know. And, and I think it's, I always said like this. If you were served a dish of pasta and you said, you know what, I don't really like this pasta. Mm-hmm. There would be no shame in saying that. Right. Okay? There's nobody in judging you saying, oh, and you should like this pasta. Okay? Right. right. However, now somebody puts a bottle of, a glass of wine in front of you that they paid 40 euros for. And yeah. you some. You say, no, I don't really, this is, this, I don't like this profile. And yeah. then people say, oh, I should like it because I paid 40 euros for it. That's right. One, I anticipate one for food and the other one for wine. And, and, and that's my point is that you know your palate. At yeah. Least knows your palate. My wife likes her palate and she likes different wines. Exactly. Than I like. And it it's great. It right or wrong. Yeah. Right. It's great. It's yeah. best that way. And it's, Really important to get to know what you enjoy and just take a, you know, keep a, a note somewhere in the back of your mind, you know, like, oh, I don't love this one. I prefer that. Yeah. Yeah. And any of these wines are incredibly cheap. Like the one I bought here recently was, was, was under 10 US dollars. Wow. Great bottle of wine. So, you know, I wouldn't serve this wine with, a, with, with, with spaghetti. I wouldn't serve this wine with with a steak. It's really a wine to be had with 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 like chick like chicken dish or or, or shrimp or, or something. Yeah, it's it really is. It's a lighter style wine, right? So, Interesting. And you can find them all over the U.S. You just have to you have to do a little bit of digging, right? Mm-hmm. Um, the next part of the question she asked about Jura. Yeah. Jura 
Jura is very mountainous region east of Burgundy, close to Switzerland. Interestingly, it is also the home of the ancestral home of Louis Pasteur, which yeah. most I guess didn't 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 know that. But um, it's become a beloved region for the the U.S. based you know sommelier community. Is that right? Because it's, it's a lesser known region, <clears throat> and I didn't even hear about it until I took this course, right? And there they grow Chardonnay, Pinot Noir, Trousseau, Polsard. I don't even think I'm saying that correctly. Uh, let's and see. Ah, oh, Poulsard, Poulsard, yeah. And Savin, Savignin Blanc, is that how you say that? Savignon? Are you sure yes. it's not Savignon? No, oh. not Savignon, it's Savignin. Yes, Savignon, a, okay, so it's yeah. another word, Savignin Blanc. Yeah. See, and I would have assumed that was a typo. Yeah, I know. Um, and it makes this wine called the... the, the Vin jaune. Vin jaune. Vin jaune. Vin jaune. And it's a yellow wine because they allow the, the great skins to sit in contact with the wine. Huh. And it's they, they're becoming very popular. I've tried a few of them from Jura, but it, I wouldn't say that I have fallen in love with the Jura wines. Yeah. I really think that there's great wine from other regions that we don't talk about that actually are extremely well priced. Because it's a smaller region, I think the wines can be can be quite hefty in, in what they cost here in the US. Mm -hmm. Well, um, it's always the same, you know, the same bottle. If you pay, there's very few exceptions to this, but if you pay 10 euros for a bottle in France, you will yeah. probably find it in the U.S. for twice that. If and not more. If not more. And one exception I have found is Mouton Cadet. Okay. Mouton Cadet, I pay 10 euros in France, and when I go to Utah, I find it for 10, 12. <laughs> and I don't know how they could do that, because with all of the taxes, especially in Utah... Yeah. Uh, yeah. But that's one I know, and I know I like it. So if I'm buying wine to go somewhere, I buy a bottle of Mouton Cadet, and it's exactly the same price. And I was like, okay. this is bizarre. Why? How, yeah. how does that happen? But it does. That, that does strike me because, as I said, the you know, because of the U.S. system with the imported distributor and wholesaler, each taking a 30% cut. Yeah. A six euro bottle, if you add 30%, and then you add 30%, and 30% can easily quickly – jump up to 20 to 22 dollars yeah i had i have a, an acquaintance whose brother makes jurançon wine so jurançon is um it's a very small region from the pyrenees okay and those are it's pretty nice it's a kind of a it's a white anyway it's a pleasant wine i've We've bought it from him a few times. And one year he said, could you help me figure out how to sell this in the U.S.? So I spent, you know, a half a day Googling this stuff. And I was pulling my hair out. It's impossible. Yeah. The, the, only, the only way I can, I mean, I only did a half a day of Googling. So I'm not, I'm hardly an expert in this. But I, I told him, you have to hire people who do this for a living because it's yeah. so complex. Yeah. I can't see how, and if I, if I wanted to say to, to be nice to you, uh, Dave, and I wanted to send you to ship you a bottle of wine to California. Yeah. I, I don't think I could. No, I don't think you can. I, I, th I could put it in my suitcase and bring it to you, yeah. but yeah. I can't ship it. It's bizarre. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so it's it goes back to any the 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 US liquor laws have not changed much since prohibition back in the when was this in the 20s yeah it's that they don't want they don't want monopolization of the of every stage of bringing the wine into the country so what they've done is they if you're an importer you can't be a distributor and wholesaler if you're a distributor you can't be a import you, you know so they're trying yeah. to break up System. So what it's done is it's added three layers, yeah. and it's just like any government. When you add three layers to anything, it becomes more com more. It becomes more complex and becomes more expensive. Yeah. Yeah. 
which is which okay. is too bad but that's yeah. again just come to france and enjoy anything you know yeah. we we have wine producers in france who make a living with a few thousand bottles that they produce per year sure you know yeah. and uh, i like i love to find those because yeah. but of course these are places where you can't find them at the grocery store in france either mm -hmm. you know you have to drive there or, or call them and have them set, ship you a box. Sure, um, sure. But those are, those are fun. I mean, uh, and we have wine clubs. There are people who, um, associations of people who just get together to talk about wines that they've liked. Yeah. And, uh, and that, that's fun, you know, because you discover wine. So you have people from the, the association that go all over the country and they stop and they buy wine and they try them and they compare them and they talk about them and they have fun. Sure. Yeah. Sure. So Jennifer also asked about some hidden gems. Um, I know we already talked about Cote, uh, Cote du Rhone, um, wines, which and you don't, you don't particularly like them, but that they are, Grenache based wines. Ah, yeah. Syrah and Mourvedre. And I think that they are extreme. Even in the US, you can find very good ones for $12, which is, which I think is, is phenomenal given, you know, the length of which they've traveled and the country that three tier system, just like what we talked about. Um, great wines. If you like Grenache, I think you will like them. And they're not specific, so they're regional wines. Mm hmm. Uh, Uh, I, also like, I also like um, Silvana and Muscat from Alsace are yeah. two that are being pulled out and replaced with Riesling because Riesling sells so much easier. But they are phenomenal, dry, fruity, but not sweet wines from Alsace. Yeah. And if I'm looking to buy a sparkling wine, now, if I was going to be on a desert island for the rest of my life, I'm taking just sparkling wines with me. Um, and I'm not taking, I'm not taking, um, uh, champagne. Well, if I could afford, I would take champagne, but Cremant, <laughs> Cremant is... Ah, oh, le Cremant, c'est bon, le Cremant. Yeah. From anywhere other than champagne, they typically made in yeah. that, it's so traditional, uh, way. You get incredible sparkling wines from Burgundy, made from the Burgundy grapes. Yeah, Alsace. les crémants de Bourgogne, les crémants d'Alsace, yeah. yep. And then the reason... And they're cheap, was... and they're cheap. Yeah. You know, you get a, a bottle of this lightly bubbly wine for 5, 10, 15, maybe, maybe. Yeah. And the region in Rus Rus Roussillon called Les, Les Mou. Ah, yes, said? yeah, yeah, yeah. Limou, Limou. Limou, uh, it's, they're already getting famous now that that region is for this. Wines. Yeah, <laughs> in here you find them for somewhere between 12 and 15 US dollars. Yeah. So oh, that's fun. If, 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 if you're looking for sparkling wine and you don't feel like spending the, the champagne money, yeah. I look those wines. Yeah, um, Limou, are, but, they're good, you know, and they're, and some of them are very dry, some of them are demi-sec, so they're a little bit yeah. more, a little sweeter, but not super sweet, but, yeah, but yeah. good, you know, they're good. And then the final thing she asks about are the rosés, and rosés are becoming, again, I think it's also because it's spring here now, very, very popular in the US, but um, it kind of makes me laugh a little bit because Really, I mean, France has been drinking copious amounts of rosé for many, many years. We still, you know, playing catch up, yeah. Mm -hmm. But um, all rosé is obviously made from red grapes because that's where the color comes from the skin. Yep. And flavors. Mm -hmm. um, and the if you look at rosés on the shelf, you'll see perhaps like a, an array of color to them. And really, that color comes from what we talked about, which was how much gun contact the winery allows the, the, the grapes and the juice to sit together. Um, the, so the, the grapes are typically picked, uh, pressed, um, allowed to have some skin contact, and then separated depending on, on the skin, how much color they want. And the temperature of the fermentation is, is cold so or cooler, and that's to 
preserve the um the, the fruit flavors that come with those all those you know nice like strawberry uh, flavors and stuff like that hmm. um and then um yeah and 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 typically if they're made in the fall we'll almost see them in you know by march hitting the grocery stores so they're not they're not aged for very long. They're certainly not aged on the yeast cell or an oak. Yeah. They are made to taste like light and fruity and, and um, you know, maybe 11% alcohol, somewhere around there, or 12%. And, uh, and the, but there are two, there's two different methods. I already talked to this one about called direct pressing. So, which what they'll do is they'll, at the time that the um, grapes are in, contact with the skin cell press, they'll push the the, the the grape must through a press and actually separate it like like that way. Mm-hmm. Um, and those tend to pr- produce the more provincial rosés, this lighter pink color. If you have seen wines from the region of Tavel, which yeah. is in southern Rhone, yeah. they're typically more darker red and maybe even have a little bit of an orange tinge to them huh. and the reason they like this is that the grapes skins are allowed to stay in contact for a little bit longer and the grapes are not pressed they are actually it's called it's bleeding so they open a um, spigot and the juice naturally just by gravity flows out hmm. they take that juice and then they ferment that juice and what is it produces a darker colored pink wine. Interesting. Um, Tavel rosés are my favorite. Their flavor profile is a lot more. It's a lot more noticeable than a uh, a rosé from Provence. Huh, I'm gonna have to go find some now. <laughs> you will not, Annie, when you walk in the store and you ask. And you hold a bottle of rosé from Provence and one from Tavel, but they're noticeably going to be very different in, in, in color. So they're darker. They're typically darker, and they have a lot stronger um, flavor profile huh. than, than, than Provence. Which is good because typically the, the rosés, they don't have very much flavor, and I tend to like a wine with a bit more flavor to it. Yeah, and, and, and they are a little bit more expensive than from from. Provence. Mm-hmm. So you're going to spend, if you spend, say you're spending five euros on a bottle from Provence, you're going to end up spending probably close to 10 or maybe 12 for the one from Tabal. Hmm. Okay. Well, that's so, okay. Tabal is, is a region in the southern Rhone. It's close to Chateau Neuf de Pop. Oh, I've seen those. I'm Googling it as you're talking. Yes, I, rec- I even yeah. recognize the bottle. They're not so far from Avignon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, they sometimes have a very unique bottle that they've, I think it's a regional style bottle, but they're not all in that same bottle, but I know which bottle you, you mentioned. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, so they're selling it like here. I could order it online, a bottle, a case of six for forty two sixty for a rosé, Tavel Rosé. So that's like seven seven euros something. Yeah. That's not bad, Annie. No. It is not. So they have as much as 52 euros. Mm-hmm. But, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I will have to go and, and uh, at the grocery store and notice them. I, I've yeah. probably had them and I just don't like, I didn't remember the name. Yeah, and they, they are in the U.S. stores, but I would say for every four bottles, no, maybe for every five bottles of rosé from Provence, you would see maybe one from one, one from Tavel. But because it's it's less known, you're not going to probably find them in a regular grocery, grocery store. You'll find them at more the high end. Yeah. Um, uh, wine shops, but then again, well, I ran into the first time I actually tasted them. I found it in uh, Costco, the United huh. States. So, mm-hmm. Yeah, so even Costco will have them occasionally. Do Costco? I don't. The the Costco's where I go are all in Utah, and they don't sell wine because they can't. But uh, do they sell wine by the bottle or by the case? No, by the bottle. Yeah. Oh, that's good. Costco is Costco is the biggest alcohol. Um, 
retail in the U.S. Huh. They sell more wine than anybody else. In fact, some of the flagship stores sell absurdly amount of wine and spirits. Well, and if it's like everything else at Costco, they probably select good quality anyway, right? I mean... They, they have... Uh, the, our flagship store here in San Diego has six people that, that just all they do on it, all they do is wine. wine and six spirits. people? They, oh, wow. Six people at the time. Yeah, that's one store. And it, that doesn't include the one that's around the house. Wow. So it's it's a huge, you know. I mean, I always <laughs> I always look at people's grocery carts when I'm leaving Costco, and yeah. invariably there's at least a bottle, if not two or three, of wine in almost every you know yeah. paper, uh, person shopping. Right. Well, that's impressive because even in France, at a big grocery store, you sometimes have two or three people on staff to help with wine. Yeah. But I've never seen more than that. So that's that's impressive. We're talking about, when I say six people, these are the buyers, the guys working the, the, the floor. Right, so right. Not, you pause for a second and someone asks you if you need help choosing something, selecting something. Yeah. Um, yeah, and what I've heard, I don't, I don't know if this is true or not, but they have a, a, a number of warehouses in the U.S. that do nothing but they buy and hold. So what they'll do is they'll buy wine, hold it for five years and then they release it because they can release it at a higher price point than when they bought it. Mm -hmm. And also it's take it's take it's taken that five years under strict climactic conditions to actually to right. age. So right. they can guarantee the quality to the consumer. Which is good. That's what you want. Yeah. 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 That's what you want. Do you do you have a, a wine cellar? Do you have a wine fridge? I have a little wine fridge, Annie. Um, it's only, I think, 50 bottles, but I don't have that many in the bottle in, in, in at any one time. Do you recommend the one? Problem, it depends where you live. We live inland, so it can get hot in the summer and it can get cooler in the winter. And yeah. wine does not typically like a huge fluctuation in temperature. Yeah. But yeah. some folks that I know in San Diego where they're down near the coast will just put it in a cooler part of their house. mm um, but you know, I mean, we purchase wine very differently in the U.S. than than an old world. They say that the the ninety percent of wine is consumed within twenty four hours of being purchased. <laughs> we buy wine that fast. Whereas I think in the old world, it's very common in stores. You know, folks are buying two three cases. And then they're taking it home and putting it in their basement or in their wine cellar in, in, in France. We saw okay, this part of that. start over with that because I couldn't hear you there for a minute. No, I said we buy wine to consume immediately. Ah. So we, we buy it, we take it home, we drink it that night. Whereas in what we saw in France was very common to see folks leaving wine wineries with, you know, three, four cases of wine. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And, you know, that's not because they're having a party that night, but they're taking it and putting it in their wine cellar and they'll drink it over the course of the year. Yes. Maybe over a couple of years. A lot of houses have wine cellars. So yeah. That, so, so we don't necessarily have a basement, but we have a wine cellar. <laughs> yeah, so it's a cooler part of your house that doesn't fluctuate in temperature. It doesn't yeah. go up. It's underground. Yeah, it's underground yeah. typically. So we don't really have that here, and in, 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 in not in San Diego. In other parts of the country, there obviously have basements. We don't have them here in, uh, in in California typically. So folks buy wine fridges and, and keep the wine in yeah. you know, fifty seven Fahrenheit, which is up what is it like fourteen fifteen Celsius something like that. Yeah, no, maybe maybe it's a bit colder than that. It's thirteen. Yeah, my my, I have a little wine fridge, and it's thirteen or seven, if it's white. Okay, yeah, yeah. So. But it really depends on if I want to keep the wine long term. I mean, some of yeah. the wine has about. I mean, if we drink it within six months, does, would it would it hurt if it's sat in the cupboard? Probably not. No. But some wines I buy, you know, I bought some wines for my kids so that when they turn twenty one, they can we can we can crack it open and. It's, it's a wine meant to, to age. Mm -hmm. And that one I would want to keep in a wine fridge. Oh, yeah. You know, 
may, uh, hopefully we keep it to the point where it tastes as fresh as it, is, it would be today, right? Yeah, yeah. But that's that's fairly typical for for serious wine collectors or, or what. But as I said, most folks don't. They will buy a wine one at four and they'll drink it by six. It's it's really that's the way it <laughs> works. That's that's the buying yeah in the US. That's yeah. funny. That's funny. <laughs> yeah. Very good. All right. Have we have we talked about most of this stuff? I think we have. I, we have, Andy. We we touched on everything. I mean, hopefully, you know, between the podcast and some of the links. Um, yeah, people can get a lot of good information. And if you care about this stuff, honestly, it's worth learning a little bit, but not so much that you get super picky and can't enjoy wine anymore. That's to me. That's the. Um, uh, that's the line I don't want to cross. I don't want to know so much about it that I become like hoity-toity and can't stand anything you know i want to be able to have fun with my friends and if they serve me a five euro bottle of wine i don't want to you know turn my nose at it yeah but only i think just learning a little bit helps you understand and appreciate the 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 culture and and the aspect of wine but you're absolutely right i mean nobody knows your palate as well as you do yeah so i always say this i mean you, you know if you like their wine then you like that wine. And if somebody else says, well, that wine, blah, 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 that's that's just too bad. You yeah. like that wine and, and you choose to drink that wine, right? Yep. And, uh, and it goes back to the food analogy that I already mentioned that, you know, if you like something, great, go ahead and drink it. And if, if you want to pop an ice block in it, you 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 pop an ice block in it. And, and some people will turn their nose up at that. But you know what? You enjoy it, then that that's just fine. And food pairing is the same, you know, food and wine pairing. There are rules, obviously, but you know what? If you enjoy that wine with that food, just do that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You know, there's yeah. no set in stone rules. One last thing I would say is that, I mean, it's kind of a, a thing that we've found in the U.S. And I don't know it is in, in France. I think we drink our white wines too cold. Mm. And our wine's too warm. Because when they say serve a red wine at room temperature, a room temperature coming from a cellar in in uh, Burgundy is a different temperature than a uh, room temperature from my kitchen in the summer. Yes. And so it does, I think it, it I take my reds if they've been sitting on room temperature, I just pop them in the fridge, just chill them a little bit. Yeah. And my white wines, if you take a white wine directly from your fridge, and you serve it. It's too cold. Us, it's too cold. Yeah. Um, yeah. Maybe you can do that with rosé, but maybe not with, uh, with with the white wine. If you want to be able to taste a little bit more, and so that's. I mean, again, it's it's personal preference. Let folks play with that. Chill it. Don't chill it. Maybe try different things and see what works for them. But the, I, I do think- the sommelier that uh, gave the class at the tour. He said that he takes a red wine bottle and puts it in an ice bucket for ten minutes. Yeah. Before yeah. he serves it. Yeah, and I'm... and I yeah, you, you want it kind of chilled a little bit, not too yeah. much. You don't want to forget it, you know. Yeah, yeah. So So uh, that's I mean that's everything that I had on the list to talk about, but Yep. And is... and obviously come to France and in France get daring get try different things because this is your chance and if you can get to a grocery store you know bring bring a, a cork a, a bottle opener and enjoy some you know some wines just from the grocery store and you'll see it's pretty good absolutely nanny i think that given the price i mean if you don't like something if, yeah. if you taste it with a couple of friends someone will probably like it yep i mean that's your opportunity to try as much as you can and say well I really didn't think I was going to like that wine from that region, and now I've I've, I've either changed my mind or I've yes, okay, I don't like that wine. I exactly. <laughs> I mean, the thing is that, as I said, it, it's the wine is so unbelievably cheap um, and reasonable price that you can really take risks. I think when you're spending under ten euros yeah. on a bottle, 
and not feeling like it's going to hit you in the in the pocket, right? Right, right. Yeah. yeah, it's you don't have to think about it too much because you can probably recover from a bad ball of ten euros, but at a hundred, yeah. that's different. Well, you could recover yeah. still, but it would not be a happy thought. So. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much for uh, telling telling us all these interesting things and educational things. And I hope everybody uh, go to the website, take a look at the show notes because we're going to add a lot of information uh, that we didn't get to in the show. But that's true of all the episodes. Honestly, whenever I'm producing the episode, I think, oh, we didn't think of this. And so I add it, you know, I put it in the show notes. So. Yeah, yeah. Very good. Thank you so much, Dave. And uh, okay. I, I hope to get to. I, I met Sue in person. Please give her a big hug, big hug from me. And I hope to meet you in person someday too. Okay. Thanks, Annie. All right. Thank you very much. Okay. Okay then. Bye. Bye. Thank you, Michelle Sander, Lorraine Sheehan Hennessy, and Tracy Link for signing up to support the show on Patreon in the last few weeks. Your support is much appreciated, Michelle, Lorraine, and Tracy. And I'll be publishing an episode of Lunch Break French, the exclusive content for Patreon supporters, very shortly. And thank you to all the patrons who support the show month after month. I want you to know how much I appreciate your continued support. Most donors pull the trigger and sign up to support the show on Patreon because they feel this show brings them a lot of value and they want to give back. But the way it works on Patreon is that there are rewards that go along with different levels of donation. So to support the show and Patreon and see the various rewards you can get, go to patreon.com forward slash join us. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com. Join us, no spaces or dashes. I'm always tweaking the rewards to keep it interesting, both for you and for me. So check back occasionally. Thank you for writing an iTunes review. Dan Cernal from the United States, who says, I am preparing for my honeymoon in Paris this coming October. Congratulations. And I have learned so much about France, Paris, food, wine, customs, travel, history, and so much more. Annie and Elise share their wealth of knowledge with listeners in a friendly and easy way that makes planning a breeze. I am looking forward to putting everything I've learned to use, and I will continue to listen even after I come back. Oh, that's nice. The episodes are well-produced and just the right length for a quick listen or a binge <laughs> while working or cleaning the house. Well, thank you very much. I'm glad you're enjoying the show. Congratulations on your wedding and take some good notes because who knows, I might want to have you on the show after you get back. So for my personal update on this episode, well, I have been on vacation in the U.S. for most of the month of August 2017, and it was so nice. And it turns out that when it comes to vacations, I am 100% French. <laughs> when on vacation, I like to be on vacation 100% of the time. So I hereby make a solemn promise that I will never again tell you that I'll keep publishing new episodes of the show while on vacation because it didn't happen this year and it probably won't happen in the future either. On vacation, I like to visit attractions, go to shows, visit with friends and family, sleep in, go out, uh, shop until I drop, which I did do a lot this time. Um, but, you know, not spend very much time in front of the computer. So I'm back to my regular schedule. I am happy to be in front of a microphone again, but listen, learned no podcasting or any other work while on vacation. One of my guilty pleasures while in the U.S. is visiting Costco. I got to try several French products from Costco, and most were really nice. The Conte cheese, the, the one that's eight months of aging, was just like the one I can buy in France. It was really good. There was a brie with the Dissigny branding. That was okay, but it's still a pasteurized cheese. It's it's missing some of the flavors. I thought it was overpriced. It was like nine bucks or something for just one big cheese. 
just a lot. I mean, in France, we don't pay that much for cheese. The $5 Cahors wine that I found at the Costco in Las Vegas was really good, a great value. And of course, the Costco baguette is good, even if it's outrageously expensive because it is like, Five bucks for two baguettes, that's enough to give a French person a heart attack because, you know, we pay, for the most part, we pay less than a euro for a baguette in France. Um, and also that Costco baguette has a hint of a sourdough flavor, which we don't do that in France, but, you know, it's still great bread. In France, if you want sourdough, you need to look for pain au levain or pain de campagne, I found a great resource that I want to share with you. It's a website and an app that tells you the average wait time at French museums and attractions. The site is in French, but it's full of great info and it's really worth it for those of you who speak French. And even if you don't, it's really easy to figure out because it's, you know, it's got the name of the attraction and then times. So it, there's not a lot of reading to do. The site gives you info on average wait times and the app gives it to you in real time. The site is called J'aime attendre, which is kind of crazy because that means I love to wait. <laughs> and you probably want to look at it because you don't love to wait. Uh, I'll put a link in the show notes. And there's also a link on the site under, it's, it's on jonasandfrance.com forward slash resource forward slash go to sites. Now, our vacation. On our vacation, we went to Washington, D.C., and we visited several wonderful museums there. I particularly enjoyed the National Museum of African American History and Culture. What an amazing place. Uh, we, we got same-day tickets by standing in line at 1 p.m. I, I was worried that we wouldn't get in because I hadn't planned it long enough in advance, but we got, we got in, and it... It was just sobering and amazing. I learned so much. You know, these are difficult things to think about, especially the very bottom of the museum where it's all about the history of uh, slavery and how they imported uh, slaves, uh, how various European countries imported slaves into the Americas. It's just a really interesting um, and just sad, but it's sad, but we have to know this stuff, right? So... I'm very glad that we got in. Um, and the food is really good at the museum. They have, um, you know, grits. and Well, I don't like grits, but they, they had like all these typical uh, soul food type things. It, it, it was good. It was way too much food. But uh, of course, in America, most restaurants is way too much food. Unless you go to Noodles and Company and then they give you so little that you have to order another portion <laughs> it was funny when we got eating when we got done eating at noodles and company um one one lunch um a few hours later we went to costco for you know one of my many trips to costco <laughs> and i was like well you get a better lunch at costco just eating the samples than you do at noodles and company sorry noodles and company you did not impress at all the french girls were hungry <laughs> which is weird um all right My second favorite uh, museum was the National Museum of Natural History. Really, really cool. I looked at all the skulls from, you know, evolution, human evolution, many of which were originally found in France. So it was very cool. I love the experience. They have this computer that it takes your, it takes your picture and it turns your face into Neanderthal or whatever other uh, proto-human you, you want to try. <laughs> I don't look good as a Neanderthal, I got to tell you. But hey, I tried it. It was fun. And I just can't believe that these museums are free in Washington, D.C. That is such a treasure. If you, if you get, you know, if, if you can go, you should go spend a few days. There's a lot that's wrong with Washington, but there's a lot that's right with Washington. And that's uh, the free museums, I think. Then we went to Vegas just for a couple of days. It was really, really, really hot. And Vegas is still Vegas. But I, you know, the prices have gone up so much. They, they charge a $30 resort fee per night and per room. And you now have to pay to park. Like, what is that about? I used to just be able to tip a few dollars to the valet and that was it. No, not anymore. You, you got to pay for your valet and your parking. So it's gotten really expensive. And, uh, you know, I have to say that I was really, really disappointed by the Paris Hotel in Las Vegas. I used to 
when I lived in the U.S., it was fun for me to go to the Paris and feel like I was in a little bit of France again, you know. It's not like that at all anymore. It's, it's gotten really loud. I mean, everything in Vegas is loud, but, oh, that one is really loud. It's gotten crass, and it's not French at all. Um, we sat down at a nice restaurant for dinner. More, it was called Mortorano's. It's Italian. Uh, I paid 15 bucks for what turned out to be basically a side salad with way too much vinegar. The bread was good, but I can't remember what my husband had. And But it was okay. It was He, he got a, a bigger entree. It was like 40 bucks or something, but it was okay. It, it was just not interesting. And the wine, I was like, they they had zero French wine. You had to have Italian and or American wine and... It was really expensive. Like a hundred bucks is like, you know, the cheap bottle there. It, it was really, really strange. Yeah, we got. I guess we got spoiled in France with uh, cheap and um, cheap wine and and uh, you know, if you pay forty bucks for a meal in France, you're gonna ha- you're gonna get a nice meal uh, over there. Not so much. Then after that, we went to Bryce Canyon in Utah, and that was just beautiful. I, I, I went mostly to take photos, and that really did not disappoint. We had a beautiful uh, sunset when we were there. I, I haven't edited all my photos, but I, I really want to uh, get to that soon. But I had to do the podcast first because I, I'm not postponing the podcast anymore. I'm doing it. Uh, Uh, And then we spent a lot of time with family and it's always so nice to visit family. They're so generous with their time, with hosting us, uh, with throwing parties for us, uh, you know, visiting from uh, wherever they they, they can come from. It's just lovely and I'm very lucky to have a wonderful family uh, back in the U.S. I have a wonderful family in France too. In July, I was hanging out with my French family in Spain, so I'm a very lucky person the best way to connect with me is to email me annie at joinusinfrance.com or search for the join us in france close group on facebook Lots of great conversations are happening on the Join Us in France Close group on Facebook. It's a great place to come ask specific questions about your trip and you will find lots of people willing to help out quickly there. If you have feedback on what you heard on an episode, leave me a voicemail 1-801-806-1015. That's a US number where the only thing you can do is leave a voicemail. It does not ring at my house, thank goodness, because there are listeners all over the world and I don't want to get woken up. I will play your feedback on the show unless you indicate that you don't want it played. I create a post for every episode of the show and you can find it by typing joinusinfrance.com forward slash and the episode number. This is where you can go see the list of all the things and places we talked about in each episode, the recommendations we gave, where you can see those pesky French names spelled out, and I even add timestamps to most of the episodes so you can jump straight to the right place to listen again. Joinusinfrance.com is also where you can subscribe to the newsletter. I don't email more than once a week. I never share your email address with anybody else. And I always add something extra for newsletter subscribers. So I encourage you to sign up for that. There are social share buttons on each episode on joinusinfrance.com as well. You know people who are going to be visiting France. You need to help them not fall into tourist traps by telling them about this resource. They'll have a better time in France and they'll thank you for it. This is the French tip of the week. For the French tip of the week today, I want to teach you how to say something really basic that has to do with wine. Je voudrais voir la carte des vins, s'il vous plaît. Je voudrais voir la carte des vins, s'il vous plaît. So, I would like to see the wine list, please. So, repeat after me. Je voudrais voir la carte des vins, s'il vous plaît. And this week, I also want to add a social media tip. Also, if you think one of your friends needs to hear this episode or anything that we've discussed on Join Us in France, 
Tag them in the comments on Facebook. Thank you so much for listening and thank you also for sharing this show on social media. You need to know that I mostly rely on word of mouth to reach new listeners. So any help you can provide is fantastic. Have a wonderful week and I'll talk to you next Wednesday. The Join Us in France Travel Podcast is written and produced by Annie Sargent and copyright 2017 by Addicted to France. It is released under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives license. 